and singing God's God and Army. I did put a new battery in it, 
So it's not that. Sometimes my hearing aids don't let me, oh, there we go, we're back again. Don't let me hear whether that is gone or not. Never mind, the move is on, my lord. The move is on.
evening, as we look to the Word and that the Lord has laid upon my heart, and let us pray, and my prayer, of course, is always that I can share this as the Lord has intended, and that we all receive it as it comes from Him. So let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, we come before you now, Father, to look into your precious and mighty Word. And I thank you for it, Father, for it is often sharper than any two-edged sword. And it does, dear Lord, pierce, and it does cut away. But we recognize, dear Father, that this is done in love. And this is done, dear Lord Jesus, for our strengthening and for our perfecting. And so, dear Lord God, as you use that sword, we are blessed. And we thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit that anoints and Jesus, that you came and paid such a great price for each and every one of us. May we, dear Lord Jesus, lift you up. Lift up your name before the world that they may see. And help us, dear Lord, to be better equipped as we look into the Word. Every time, Father, we search the Scripture, I pray that for my brothers and my sisters, for all of us, Lord, that your Spirit would enlighten us, would reveal to us, and show us, dear Father, what the next steps are to be, where we should go, how we should do it, and dear Lord God, how we must keep our eyes upon you at all times. Bless now, I pray, the word, and help it, dear Lord, to be a strength to us, not only in this next half hour, but Lord Jesus, that it would abide within us, that we would carry it with us wherever we go this week, and that, dear Lord Jesus, it would come back to our remembrance over and over and over again. We give you praise and we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So this evening, I have already suggested to you we're going to take a look at the church. Um, and uh, just as a reminder, once again, the definition of a church is not what we so often perceive it to be. It's not a building. Um, it's far more accurate as our particular uh, building is given the name of a tabernacle. And so the tabernacle is far more accurate as a description of the place, uh, the actual dwelling, the building in which we gather. Church is you and is me. Church is a term that refers to all those that believe, that gather together with that one belief. <clears throat> and so as we have gathered together, we are the church. Um, <clears throat> this, of course, just as an aside, means that wherever God's children gather, that is the church. And so we know in many places where they don't have a formal structure, they may gather on a field, they may gather in a basement, they may gather in a living room, under a tree, you name it, that's the church, uh, by definition. And so this evening, um, I wanted to look at um, perhaps one step in what we as God's people need to remember concerning the church. Um, <clears throat> and I start by reminding every one of us that there is only one that can make something out of nothing. And that's God, right? That's obvious to us. And so we don't uh, abide by the Big Bang sort of theory or that there are things that just sort of by chance came together. The big question then, of course, is, is where did the things come from that came together? Um, and so we know that Scripture tells us God is the creator, uh, and he made everything out of nothing by speaking the word. And as he, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were together at that time, uh, they made everything that we enjoy today. Now, having said that, God has chosen, in his wisdom, I would imagine, although I don't always understand it, but God seems to have chosen that he will work through us, and that he has for us a missionary task, uh, and one of those tasks, of course, is to gather together as the church. And so we pray one for another, and we are believing that God will increase and will provide a bountiful harvest at some point in time, which will be God's timing. But the scripture teaches us that there are certain ingredients that are required 
in order for the church to prosper, in order for the church to grow. So, you see, there are things that have to come together in order to make what God has ordained to be His church and His people. It's not enough, therefore, as I see it, for us to simply pray for growth. It's not enough for us to simply pray, Lord, bring in souls. Nothing wrong with that. That's certainly one of the ingredients. But I think sometimes we forget that there are other things that are required of us in order for the church to grow. Just like you are not going to get an apple pie unless you've got apples in some way, shape, or form, and I'm talking about the real thing now, not just some flavor that you add. Or you're not going to have a brick house unless you have bricks. And you're not going to have a happy lot of people, as we will sometimes sing, yes we are. Well, that requires spiritual ingredients. Right? There are things that have to come together in order for us to get the end result that we want to have. And so, in order to have, and I'm going to add now, God's church, we have to follow God's recipe. We can't be looking here and there and yonder to try and, you know, build up the temple. What we need to do is look into the Word of God. We have to take a look at what did God say is necessary, what are the ingredients that are required, or that we see through example, that result in the church growing. Because without the ingredients, I repeat, without the ingredients, it's not going to happen. At least not God's church. So this is where we run into some challenges, right? Because what many people will do is they will try and come up with their own recipe to grow a church congregation, right? And so they will get together, people will, perhaps with good intention, I'm not sure about that, but they will get together and they will sit down and they will say, well, if we want people to come into the church, this is what we need. So they're talking about the ingredients. And what we sometimes see happen is they neglect to look at the recipe book. Okay? And so they come up with their own recipe and they may have something that they call a church, but it doesn't look or act anything like God's church is supposed to look and act. Right? And so this is, I believe, what we're here for, right? We're here to be part of God's church. So I came out of formal religion because it didn't follow the recipe that God set forward. And we have to be careful that we don't neglect the recipe that God has set forth. Because that can happen to anyone, right? We can get carried away with one thing or another thing and neglect looking at the Word of God. As I've said many times before, we all have opinions. And those opinions can lead us astray at times because, you know, somebody might say, well, the service needs to be shorter, the service needs to be longer, we need to do more singing, we need to do more of this, we need more of that etc, etc, etc. Those are opinions. I would challenge you then and say, what does God say? What does the scripture show us? Because that is the example, I believe, and I would trust that you agree with me, that is the example that will lead to success. And then I have to say, not necessarily success as the world defines it, but success in God's so this evening, I would like to take a look at one verse, and it contains a lot. It's found in Acts chapter 9, <clears throat> and this particular verse spoke to me with regards to the growth of the church. Now when I say the growth of the church, 
If you boil that down, right, if you really look at what does that really mean, it means the saving of souls. Okay? The growth of the church, I'm equating now, I'm saying that is equal to or the same as saving of souls. So it is as a pastor, as a preacher, as a minister, my primary goal is never, I'm sorry if this offends you, but it's never to make you feel good. That's not my main goal. My primary goal is never to entertain you. That's not my goal either. My goal is to be a vessel through which the Lord can move to show and teach and reveal his thoughts for me and for you to strengthen us, to help souls to be saved, to magnify his name and to lift him up. Right? And so whatever it takes to do that, that's as a pastor, I believe that is the primary goal. And so as God has a shepherd, Jesus, who looks after his sheep, he also then ordains pastors to do that on his behalf in a similar fashion. So looking at Acts chapter 9 and one verse, that verse 31, let's just tear this verse apart a little bit. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. So I got to that part there, were multiplied, and I said, that's what I want. That's what we need. That's what we should be striving for. That's what we need to be praying about. Multiplication, right? Not just stagnation, not just holding our numbers steady, but believing God for growth. See, now that takes a little bit more faith, right? It's one thing to say, I'm going to stand fast, I'm not going to move. And scripture tells us, with regards to our beliefs and our faith and God's standards and those things, absolutely, we anchor and we hold fast. But that doesn't mean that the Lord was saying, don't move forward. That doesn't mean that the Lord wasn't saying, okay, what you've got now is good enough. I don't believe that. I believe the Lord is always looking for us to grow. And as such, is also looking for his church to grow. And so I looked here in this verse and I saw those last two words were multiplied. Which made me then have to go backwards to say, how? How were they multiplied? What were some ingredients that were part of that church that caused that church to be multiplied? Because that's what we need. That's what I need, right? I want to keep growing. I want my faith to be multiplied. I want God's blessing in me, through me, to be multiplied. I want souls to be saved so that there is growth. That's how the church is going to grow. It's not just simply by putting people in the pews. It's by putting saved people in the pews. And I understand they don't come in that way necessarily. Right? And that's often, I think, a fault that we might have in our head. Right? We might think Oh, God, bring in the people. And we might assume that they're saved already. Well, I think that's a false assumption. Right? We have to assume, more likely, that they're not. That there is something God needs to do for them. And the primary thing is that he has to save them. So how do we get that? How do we get this multiplication that the Bible is talking about here in this verse? Well... I'm only going to focus on what that verse tells us, okay? Uh, because there are two components there, uh, primary components, that I want to take just a brief, short look at uh, with regards to what helped to bring about that multiplication. And then, 
my challenge to myself or God's challenge to me and as I share it with you is how do we make sure those same ingredients stay, flourish, grow within the church? Because it looks to me as I see this verse, if that's there, then the multiplication will come. Likewise, if it's not there, you won't see the multiplication. Okay? So it's kind of a serious look, right? I mean, if you want apple pie, you've got to have the right ingredients. Otherwise, I don't care what you put in there, you're not going to have apple pie. Right? And if we want God's church, if we want God's spirit to dwell within us and to see that growth, we need the proper ingredients. So let's go back. We see here that they had uh, rest, okay, there was peace, and then it gets to this part here and it says, and were edified. So we have to make sure we understand this term edification or to be edified. So that's the, one of the first things. And I'm thankful that you're here tonight because I believe that demonstrates you're interested in being edified. Not necessarily by me, okay? But by, most importantly, God's Spirit. Edification basically talks about, or to be edified, is to be instructed and to be improved. Let me repeat that. To be edified is to be instructed and improved. Okay? So looking back at that scripture, it says the churches that were in Judea, Galilee, Samaria, they not only had rest, but they were edified. Okay? So there is room for growth. I don't care who you are, and it doesn't matter if your title says Bethel Tabernacle, right? There is always room for growth. And if we think we got to the finish line before the Lord calls us home, we are in great error. Okay? Because I see here that the churches, they were improved. They were receptive of instruction. And this is referring here, okay, if you were to go back a little bit, this is when Saul comes to Jerusalem, okay, and of course, uh, they were too eager to see him. They were afraid of him. You know, if you go back there, it says uh, in verse 26, that same chapter, and when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. In other words, he planned to do that or he attempted to do that. But they were afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. See, the, the road to growth within the early church it wasn't smooth sailing. There were conflicts, there were struggles, there were people who believed not quite the same thing as other people believed, right? And along comes Saul and the disciples that were still in Jerusalem, ah, wait a minute, he's not a disciple, we don't want to hang out with him. Right? And it took some work, it took, I'm sure, some prayer but eventually, we see that he comes in, and in verse 29, he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, disputed against the Grecians, uh, but they went about to slay him. And that's a whole other lesson, right? But the point is here that they were being taught by, not Saul, God was using Saul, right? And so it could have been anybody else, because God's not limited. And then... To that I say, if and when we think we're so important that we can't be replaced, get ready, you're about to be replaced. Because God's always got another tool in the toolbox. And it may come from a source that is quite surprising. Okay? But that's God's doing. So while God is willing to use us, let's be used. Okay? And let's be open to edification. Let's be open to God revealing himself through the scripture and showing me and showing you, showing the church that maybe, just maybe, there's something that needs improvement. Well, no, I'm going to take that back. 
There's always something that needs improvement. Okay? And let's be open to that, have discernment, have wisdom, and accept the knowledge of the Lord so that we could also say we have been edified. That's an important step in the growth of the church, right? Because if we, who've been here for 5 years, 10 years, 20 years, 30, 50, whatever, 60, 70, 80, whatever number of years we have been part of the church, we have to be prepared to still be teachable, still be those that are willing to grow. And what that shows others that are interested in coming in is that they too have an opportunity to grow. We need to be examples. Right? And we can't be judgmental in the sense that we're always putting them down and putting other people down because they don't know as much as we do well, there's always somebody who knows more. And God is ultimately the one who knows it all. Okay? So I choose to sit at his feet so that I can be edified. Those are the only feet that I'm willing to sit at. Right? Because he is the master teacher. He knows exactly the lesson that I need. Then it gets into what I consider to be in this verse the two key pieces to that multiplication, right? The first piece, it says, and walking in the fear of the Lord. Okay? We have to make sure we never, never lose personally and collectively the fear of the Lord. Respect for Him. Honor for Him. Lifting Him up above all else putting Him first in our personal lives and in our congregational life. Because as they were walking in, and perhaps we just have to pause for a minute, what, what does that mean to you when you see that, walking in the fear of the Lord? I thought about it this way. I thought about, you know, if I go walking down a path, or the scripture talks about the straight and narrow way, right? Well, how do I know I'm on the path? How do I know I'm in the way? Generally, I know that because there is some form of boundary. Right? I know I'm on a path because in the natural, the path is often worn, right? And you can see it weaving through the tall grass and the trees, etc., etc., Right? So you know you're on the path. Therefore, you also can discern when you have stepped off the path. So what the scripture is really saying here, that when they say they're walking in the fear of the Lord, it's suggesting <clears throat> that there are boundaries that God puts in place for our behavior. And that in order for the church to be multiplied... They had to stay within those boundaries. You can't go veering off just any which way you feel like it. Okay? And the fear of the Lord helps to create those boundaries, that respect. You see, it governs our behavior. It governs how we approach the Lord in humbleness. Not proud or boastful. Not demanding of God. But recognizing our place and his place is part of having the fear of the Lord. Scripture goes into a little bit of detail. And again, uh, we can't dive too deep. I just wanted to sort of touch on this evening. But travel with me to Psalm 111. And we'll just look at something, a quick verse in Psalm and two verses in Proverbs that have to do with the fear of the Lord. It's actually a rather broad sort of topic, or shall I say, the fear of the Lord has great benefits for us. Okay? So here in Psalm 111, <clears throat> verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments, his praise endureth forever. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time embellishing 
what the Word of God says. But I look at that, I see that if I want wisdom from God, which is what I want, right, I need to respect Him. I need to honor Him. I need to fear Him, right? Because that will result in me starting, notice it says the beginning, of wisdom, it will result in me starting to gain the wisdom that God wants to give to His people. Keep in mind that word wisdom, okay? With relationship here to the church multiplying. Okay? Because when it says walking in the fear of the Lord, it's now telling me that as I walk in the fear of the Lord, I am going to gain wisdom. So this church was walking in the fear of the Lord, what were they gaining as a church? They were gaining spiritual, heavenly wisdom. That's important for multiplication and for growth. Turn now to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. A similar verse, but it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, what you need to do, I will ask you to do, is this week, pray about these verses and let the Spirit show you how they intertwine with one another. Okay? Notice this verse in Proverbs refers to instruction. Remember what edification was. Right? improvement or instruction. Same thing. Alright? So now, fear of the Lord not only gives us wisdom, but it also gives us knowledge. And I would conclude that both of those things now are necessary as part of the ingredients to help the church to multiply. One more verse regarding that fear of the Lord. Just a little further in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs 8 and 13 and this one here, I like this verse, and I chose this one, because this one, actually, you know how in Sunday school this morning, we were again a little bit focused on the demonstration of our faith, right? You know, this outward action, showing that we have faith. Well, it says here, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Okay? So in other words, if we are walking in the fear of the Lord, we will demonstrate that by standing firmly against evil. Are you following with me? Can you see that? Okay. It goes on. Let me just go back. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. So, backtracking again. If we are looking for the church to multiply, it appears to me that we need to be walking in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord helps to give us wisdom, helps to give us knowledge, and if we have the fear of the Lord, we will demonstrate that by, as it says in verse 13, hating evil, hating or not having pride, not having arrogance, hating the evil way, not having a froward mouth. You see, a church that's looking to grow has to have standards. And those standards have to be God's standards. See, there are a lot of churches today that they want to grow. I mean, every pastor wants a church to grow. Every congregation is anxious to see their numbers increase. But they go about it the wrong way. Their growth is temporary. Their growth is not real. Because they get rid of standards. And that's not the answer. The answer is to have standards. Okay? And those have to be demonstrated. They have to be preached. They have to be taught in love. Right? So that those that enter in understand that if you are to be a child of God, there are expectations on you. And they don't come from the pastor. 
And they don't come from somebody else sitting in the pew. They come from God. And if they choose to follow those standards and demonstrate their fear of the Lord as God expects them to, then they'll stick around. But if there are no standards, my belief is that people will come and go willy-nilly, right? Because if there are no standards here, you can find another place where there are no standards there. And it's easy then, right? But if you're looking for the truth, that might be a little more difficult to find. And so we have to make sure that the banner of the Lord is high and that part of that banner is a definite adherence. We have to stick to the fear of the Lord. Never lose that peace. The verse then goes back. I can find it again. I'm back in Acts. And the second part here, what does it say? It says they were walking in the fear of the Lord and, in other words now also implying, walking in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. So the fear of the Lord is necessary and you can do a much deeper study into what that entails. I just sort of touched on it a little bit. But this idea of walking in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. So obviously, based on that statement, the Holy Ghost is necessary, must be part of God's church. Without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, there can be no multiplication. But I wanted to look just briefly at this idea of comfort. What does it mean when it says walking in the comfort of the Holy Ghost? And to do this, I looked at this word comfort, and I sort of tore it apart a little bit. So, not to belabor it, but the C-O-M, the com, com part of the word, right? we divide this word up, comes from the Latin meaning together and with. Okay? So the first part of comfort means together. That kind of fits, right? If you think about your own definition of comfort, when we're comforting someone, we generally have to be with them in some way, shape, or form, right? We're on the phone with them, we're in the presence of them, we're sitting with them. Sometimes there's a physical aspect, the touching of a hand, holding a hand. There's a together part. That's where that comes from, okay? Come, Latin for together and to be with. The second part, fort, basically means strength and power. Okay. So to comfort somebody is to be with them and to provide them. We often think about hope, right? And, you know, you've got your hand on them or whatever, you know, trying to lift them up. Well, how do we do that, really? We do that by offering them strength. And so by walking in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, it's talking about walking with the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost sharing with us His strength. Because we all know, right, and we often refer to the Holy Ghost as being the power, right? That's the fire that the church needs. And so here we see churches that were multiplying, that were growing, because they were teachable, they were edified, and because they were walking in a path that included the fear of the Lord and included the Holy Spirit. And a recognition of the fact that they needed the power, the strength that only the Holy Spirit can give. Because without that, individually we all crumble. And likewise, without the Holy Spirit and His anointing, His leading and guiding, His strength, His comfort, Him being with us, right? It's not that the Holy Spirit can be far away someplace. We don't believe that, right? We talk about Christ within. Well, the Holy Spirit needs to be within as well. 
And he then shares with us that strength that helps us, right? So go to John chapter 14. Three verses, sections of scripture in John, <coughs> referring to the Holy Spirit, that are important for us to recognize as being crucial ingredients for the church to multiply. First, I'm in John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. Jesus is speaking here, and again, these verses aren't particularly unfamiliar to us. We're very familiar with them. But I want you to look at them now through the lens of what is Jesus saying that the Holy Spirit will give us that we need. Okay? And so he says in verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. And so this abiding part, dwelling with us, right? Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. So just highlighting two pieces there. The Holy Spirit has to be in the church. Who is the church? You are. So the Holy Spirit has to be within His people. Alright? And notice this verse. Again, it's pretty plain for us. But notice it says here, even the Spirit of truth. Right? So it's important that for a church to grow, it has to stand on the truth. And only on the truth. And what is preached, what is taught, what you share amongst each other as you are talking before a service or after a service, as we pray, it must all be truth according to Scripture. That's really critical. All right? Because again, that creates a standard that we walk in. And so the Holy Spirit is there to help us with that. John chapter 15, flip over the page in my Bible, chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, so there it is again, right, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and, here's the important part for the church, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. What's it talking about? The church needs to have a testimony. The church needs to bear witness of what Christ has done and is doing and is going to do. Right? And that is through what people see, what people hear, and what we share with them. Right? It is a growing church that has a testimony, right? Because that church is able to speak about life. And where does that life come from? It comes from the Lord, by His Spirit. I don't want to be in a dead place. What's the point? Then we end up with blind leading blind and dead leading the dead, etc., whatever, right? That's not what God's church is supposed to be. When people walk through the door who are hungry, who are seeking, who are questioning, who are wondering, who need something, they don't need death. They need life. And that has to be part of the church's testimony. The witness of God and His Spirit coming by walking in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Last verse, and it's in chapter 16, verses and I'm going to read a few here, 7 to 11. Chapter 16 of John, beginning at verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, <coughs> excuse me, because the prince of this world is judged. The Holy Spirit, walking in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, then also provides the church with the power, the strength, to reprove 
the world of sin. Okay. Without that, we don't have the strength to do that. And you see, as the world gets darker, as opposition to churches, real churches I'm talking about now, and real Christians keeps increasing in the workplace, in the public place, you name it, right? Going against God's people. As that opposition increases, the more and more we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Because without it, we will not be able to stand. We will not. And if, even if, let me put it this way, and this is not the happiest picture, but even if we are able to stand, right, and if all we're doing is standing, then the devil will win by attrition. We're not going to live forever. Face it, one by one. Our prayer, Lord, you're going to call me home. What's going to be left of the church? What's going to be left of the church? See, the multiplication of the church isn't just for the benefit that I can stand up here and preach to 50 people or 100 people or 150 or 200 people. That's not the point. The point is, if there is multiplication within the church, then there is life in the church there is a tomorrow in the church. And God wants there to be a tomorrow in the church. Right? Because that church of tomorrow has the same, I'm going to say burden, same responsibility, same calling upon it to share the gospel. To share the gospel. Well, if the real churches aren't growing, and just holding fast. Eventually the trees are going to get old and they're going to fall over. Where are the saplings? Where are the young trees? Where are the ones that will take the place? Okay. Now God says he will always have a remedy. I understand that. But you see I have a prayer in my heart. That here there will be a remedy. That here there will be growth. That here there will be multiplication. That Lord, could you use us? Could you use us to keep a fire burning here so that it can spread? Is that your desire? Is that my desire? Is that really what we would want? Because if we want it, we need the ingredients that God says the church needs. Otherwise, we're putting in time. It's positive time. I mean, you know, I benefit from your prayers, you benefit from mine, that's all great. But are we building up the kingdom? Are we part of that? I'll leave you to answer that question. Right? But my desire is that we see that. And as these churches, they were able to be multiplied. They didn't have the technology. They didn't have all the fanciness. They didn't have all the fancy, you know, comforts and all of those things. And yet people came. Imagine. And yet they came. And it wasn't to be entertained. And it wasn't always pleasant. Because Jesus told it like it was. And yet they still came. Because the ingredients were there that God says, this is what we need. Would you stand with me, please, tonight? Take a look at those verses this week. Study them a little further. Pray, pray, pray about them. And I believe you will see, my prayer is the Lord will reveal what God has for you and for me. Let's close. Dear Lord Jesus, I do thank you. Lord, Father, for your promises. This morning in Sunday school we talked about faith. And how important it is to have faith in you. Well, I look to the scripture and I see, dear Lord God, what you were able to do with those churches. And not just in Jerusalem. We talked about Samaria. talked about different places. The key piece 
was that these people, that Christ was within them, they were the church, and they were prepared to walk the way you told them, to do what you told them to do, to receive what they needed. And lo and behold, the fire was catching. The fire was catching. People saw, people heard. The windows of heaven were open. The blessings poured out. And others saw, hey, that's where I want to be. There's life there. There's healing there. There's deliverance there. There's power there. There's something there that's going to change who I am and the mess I'm in. That something wasn't people. It wasn't some special speaker. It wasn't just Saul. I believe, Lord, it was you. It was you. And Father, let our hearts hunger for you and your spirit and the ingredients that we need to be strength, not only for ourselves, but strength for one another. That when we pray for those that are sick, when we pray for deliverance, when we pray for healing, Lord, in Jesus' name, wipe out our doubts. Take away our fears. Help us, dear Lord Jesus, not to question, not to linger on the things that Satan wants to put in our hearts and minds, but to say, in Jesus' name, Satan, get out. Get out, because we are stepping where you have stepped, Lord. We want to walk in that path. Walk in the fear of the Lord, and walk in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, we're going to pray now individually. We bring before you our petitions. You know the list is rather long, but Father, it doesn't matter. You can take care of the whole list from top to bottom. It doesn't matter how long it is. Let us have faith to believe and to be active in the ministry. I ask in Jesus' name.